Hey folks, welcome. We'll get started in just a moment. Actually, I see it's one after, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. May, can you hear me? Yep, perfectly. Okay. Well, good day, everyone, and welcome to our third Zoe quarterly webinar. We hosted our first webinar last October and our second on January 20th, and we plan to host these webinars once per calendar quarter. So this will serve as our Q2 2021 webinar. Um, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, all of the attendees will be on mute. Uh, the webinar will be recorded for replay. And um, your means for asking questions will be to either use the chat or the, uh, the Q&A button. So I'm Rose Saycatch, Zoe onboarding squad lead, and I'll be kicking us off and wrapping us up. Um, so once again, we've got quite a bit of content to cover. Here's our general plan. We'll quickly review the overall intent of these quarterly webinars. We'll cover a focus topic. Um, this, top, this quarter's topic is the API mediation layer, uh, tokens and their role in API security. Um, we'll follow that by a deeper dive on a specific Zoe squad. And this month we're featuring the Zoe onboarding squad and Zoe metrics. Uh, before we end, we'll run a quick poll. Uh, we'll list out some important events with dates. We'll share some important event links, the Zoe calendar links, and of course, links to our Slack channels where you can continue to stay in touch with the Zoe community. Um, time permitting, we'll try and open up for, for just general Q&A, but we typically do not have time to do that. So please, we encourage you to certainly post your questions as we go. Okay, so our intent for this webinar series is to offer a forum for open exchange of information and ideas. The goal is to give both members of the community and those beyond the community insights into what's happening with the Zoe project and how to stay connected. Our plan is to host these webinars in a regular cadence. Uh, so far, we've, we've stayed on track with once per quarter and we plan to continue to do that. Uh, the format will remain the same as we just described. We'll have a focus topic, uh, an update from at least one Zoe squad, uh, project planning information, awareness around upcoming events, uh, and in some cases, prior events, such as uh, conferences that have just hosted uh, some Zoe sessions, and we'll give you some new to you uh, information, which could be technical or it could be more general. Uh, and finally, we're leveraging these webinars to collect some feedback from a wider audience, uh, all parties interested in all things Zoe. So at times we'll, we'll be running polls and we do have a poll today. Okay, so let me introduce you to Mikal and Pavlin as we transition into our focus topic. Over to you guys. Thank you, Rose. You can proceed to the next slide, please. Um, so let's let's jump right into it. So we are living in a world of uh, where, where the tokens have many applications, like providing a physical access to the bars, restaurants, or, the, or rather making sure you can return back to them. Well, let's call this application a physical access. Another example would be the usage of tokens that you can exchange for a set of services like a supermarket card or when you purchase a token at the gas station to get uh, a coffee or you are given a temporary key to access some facilities. An example from digital world would be um, cryptocurrency. A secured browser called Brave is using something called basic attention tokens. The way this works is that you are rewarded with a token for browsing websites and you can then use this token to pay content creators for services, which is kind of an elegant way to go around the fact that most of the people expect things uh, on the internet to be for free. Essentially, a token is a representation of something in a particular um, ecosystem domain or context. And, and this something can be virtually anything. It can be value, access, or currency, as mentioned. In this sense, the applications of the tokens are limitless. 
so and now the reason we are here today is to talk about the usage of tokens in a security or cyber security context more specifically about the access to zoe apis using uh, software security tokens that are offered to clients um, to the client side via zoe api ml also um, we are here today to talk about how we could integrate mainframe with other domains and platforms more easily by introducing tokens that are not yet employed in Zoe. And um, in general, just to maybe inspire a conversation about it. We believe that a single type of token that we use in Zoe today might not cover all the Zoe use cases in the future. Let's proceed to um, the, an agenda. In the next 25 minutes, Pavlin and I will be showing you the implementation of uh, JADs in Zoe, how client side can use them today, what are the configuration options. We'll take a look at the JAD artifact in details, and then we'll go broader uh, uh, with the tokens outside of the mainframe spectrum. Traditionally, we'll talk about refresh tokens, access tokens, identity tokens. First, we'll um, talk about their formats, functions, and then we'll summarize possible enhancements to Zoe in the end. And we'll highlight three major takeaways, provide some best practices and glossary of terms to go. Um, before we jump on the Zoe implementation itself, let's begin with listing some of the challenges when it comes to the user access in general. So first one is that your credentials needs to be proven, meaning there is going to be some sort of provider of identity and the system has to be able to tell whether or not you are, who do you say you are. This is called authentication of the user and typically serves as an, an initial entry point, the, the gate uh, rather to the system. Uh, now this authentication has, has uh, multiple, multiple types. Um, most commonly, it's a login of when, when it comes to the human user, when it comes to the application authentication or authenticating to the system, it's usually uh, certificates. Now, second challenge is that once you successfully gone through the authentication, the, the step one, then the system has to be able to tell what do you have access to, meaning what resources, in our case, what resources on mainframe can be used in the context of the application. And this is called authorization rights or uh, rather authorization of the user. By the way, I'm listing uh, kind of these broader terms under every challenge to just highlight the fact that these things are larger topics and there are vendors who, who specialize in these areas and offer uh, commercial solutions. The third one will be that the administrator of the system has to be able to manage your access to the application. Even uh, after you've gone through step one and stu uh, step two, it could be that uh, your access has to be revoked or vice versa extended for some reason. And the final challenge is about matching the identities across different platforms to allow for better interoperability and user experience. Now, all of these challenges, and, and this is the point of the slide, uh, is that they can be addressed using uh, tokens. And we already addressed most, most of them uh, in some way in Zoe. So let's take a look how the Zoe implementation works. Um, so we have the authentication in place. And, and the way it works is from the usability point of view, is once your systems programmer deploys mediation layer, you have an access to authentication endpoint that lets you post your credentials to the mainframe security provider. The provider is SAF, or it could be um, via a mediation layer that is ZSMF. And after you send these credentials, provider then validates them. And upon a positive, positive outcome of that validation, the token is provided provided and the token uh, is called uh, JSON web token. And, and uh, the way this works is, is, is that uh, as long as the client side possess this token, your access is fine. Some of the components of Zoe ecosystem already use this feature for some time, just as an example. 
uh, API catalog and Zoe CLI. Um, both um, enablements are actually documented and you can, you can test, it, uh, test it out for yourself. Um, in case you wonder, when it comes to the catalog, the token will be stored in the browser. And uh, for Zoe CLI users out there, the token will be in the configuration profile. Important is that no user ID or passwords are stored. They are merely used once in the login prompt of both interfaces. Now you can see that uh, this endpoint does not say anything about authorization. That is because we have self security profiles taking care of that, which is um, on mainframe today, the most secure thing to do. When it comes to revocation, the life cycle of the token is managed by the provider. Uh, there are options in the gateway to log out the user using, uh, I, th I think it could be an API or some sort of configuration in the runtime uh, in terms of uh, identity federation. That's a uh, future as far as I know. Um, Zoe does not address that just yet, but there are um, there is potential to um, to uh, to somehow um, make sure that we have federation uh, across the security domains, uh, meaning RACF, TSS, ACF2, which is a good start, I think. So now um, these are couple of ways how to set the tokens up in Zoe. In all these use cases, the client side does not really have to care from, from where the tokens are coming from. And so this is more for the sysprogs out there. I would like to just highlight the fact that there is an option that does not require set to SMF to be deployed, in which case API ML gateway provides a, a token on the SAF call. Zoe API ML squad is looking uh, also at adding the support for SAF identity tokens that I mentioned before in terms of the federated uh, federation of the domains. The biggest value here beyond what I mentioned is the fact that they are issued, validated and managed directly by ZOS um, ESM SAF. Let's, um, yeah, thank you. And um, before I hand over to Pavlin, um, this is a little detail uh, on the JSON web token itself. So as you can see, um, JAT is a JSON document that can be signed and optionally encrypted. It contains a couple of strings. First one, um, the header typically contains of two parts, the, uh, the type of the token, which is JAT, and um, the, signet, uh, the, the signing algorithm that was used in this uh, example, it's RS256. And then we have the payload, which contains a set of claims. Uh, claims are pretty much a statements about an identity. Typically it's the user. And uh, it also contains some additional data like uh, the time of uh, when the token was issued uh, its expiration date and the issuer, which is the security provider and the SMF in this case. There could be more types of claims for different use cases, uh, but uh, maybe Pavlin will address uh, them uh, later in the presentation. Lastly, I want to just uh, explain the signature. Uh, signature is used uh, to validate whether or not the token is trustworthy and hasn't been tampered with. And, um, and uh, I would like to move um, the presentation to Pauline. Hello, everyone. Uh, just first, I want to ask if you hear me. I often have uh, sound related problems. We can hear you. I can, I can hear you. Yeah. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, then uh, thank you, Michal for introducing the stuff and even providing uh, a lot of details. I'll be uh, joining that and go further. Uh, on the first simple slide, uh, uh, this is the first uh, category or group of uh, questions I want to touch. And initially, the well, first thing to talk about is uh, a token's taxonomy. Uh, 
which intends to tell you what kind of tokens exist according to different criteria and uh, what they intended for, how we can use them, what is the benefit of having them. So uh, in the second uh, part, uh, I will provide you with some best practices about using the tokens. Uh, it's just the general best practices, uh, which uh, in the form of checklist. And uh, in the second part, we'll move closer to Zoe and the security practices in Zoe, uh, contemporary and future, uh, showing how we imagine improvements in Zoe while uh, keeping the security top notch as it is used to be on the mainframe. Now, thank you. Uh, on this slide, uh, there is uh, the basic setup uh, and roles how uh, the modern security is intended to work. So uh, we always have a user, it might be an application, but it's still a an user. And then there would be a client, which basically is a client application, which the user is uses to access resources. But before the user can access resources, they need to be authenticated. And that's why they are uh, sending their credentials to the authorization server which surprisingly is providing authentication in the first step. But uh, as a result from this authentication process, the authorization server will grant uh, access to the client application to act on behalf of the authenticated user. It seems kind of complicated switching the roles of the user and client, but in the end, it's just about the user doing their job through an application accessing a resource server. And the resource server needs to know who uh, is the user and who is the client. Uh, and, and this is uh, easy to verify, validate, uh, having the access token provided by the authorization server. I can move further. Okay, so we now go to the taxonomy. Uh, it's a simplified one, uh, not exhaustive, not complete. Uh, but important for the purpose to explain uh, what we have now in Zoe security and uh, what we envision to use in the future. Uh, the first category is the format of the tokens, where we uh, distinguish a reference token, the simplest one, then opaque token, a bit more complicated, and JWT token, the most modern kind of token, actually a family of tokens with different features, which we'll be discussing a bit later. Uh, second category to introduce it, uh, it's a division by a function or usage of the tokens. Uh, so already mentioned access token helps to access some resources. Identity token uh, tells us who is the user eventually plus some extended information about it. And the refresh token is the, uh, later addition of the OAuth 2 protocol, uh, which says uh, that we can prolong uh, user access by reissuing access tokens based on the refresh token. I'll talk about it a bit later. The third category uh, is uh, kind of optional and I probably will not talk about it extensively in this presentation because it's a bit more technical, but basically it is uh, that uh, since the tokens are delivered from the client to the resource server uh, through protocols uh, which uh, can be trusted while uh, in place like uh, TLS, uh, that's fine, but we just don't know uh, who is behind the keyboard and we uh, don't know how to prove the ownership of a token if we don't employ advanced techniques as it mentioned here, POP or HOK. Next slide, please. So the first token to talk about, uh, the reference token. It is a actually very simple thing. Uh, it has to be a randomly generated string as a definition, but also it has to be unique in the given context. It has to be unique in time as well. Uh, and then it should be hard to guess and forge. So randomly generated number between one and 10 is not very difficult to, to guess. So this is not a suitable uh, reference token. Um, the, 
usage of reference token is based on the fact that it is actually serves as an ID to more extended information, which is kept securely on the server. So the token is referencing this information. Uh, normally the security server or authorization server will expose an endpoint where uh, the owner of the token can redeem it for the extended user or client information. Uh, there is a need to immediately say that uh, there is a warning here that reference tokens are often wrongly used to contain meaningful information. People think that if they code it somehow, this is safe. But as you see, we have a token here. It looks unreadable. I just don't know what's written there. But if uh, we click once again on the slide, we'll see that uh, actually this is uh, the text which is in the box here. Uh, and it's a simple encoding, uh, encoded uh, with base64, so uh, it's not very difficult to decode it using internet tools widely available and free. Uh, so we may not, rec not recognize that the token is uh, uh, easy to guess, but hackers will try and eventually will forge it. So then simple obfuscation is not sufficient and uh, having some logic in generating the token is also not good because logic can be broken around the randomness if in good size and scale cannot be or not that easily. Next slide, please. Second type of token, opaque token. Uh, it actually can be a reference token as well. Uh, the main feature of opaque token is that it's not readable. So whoever can see it on the client side uh, just cannot read it, cannot understand what's in it. So if it is a reference token, it's not readable, it serves the purpose, but then it has to be redeemed on the server. In cases when we want to encode some information, uh, we need to do a bit more than just encoding with uh, base64 encoding. Um, we can have a structure in the token and we need to sign it to be able to verify that it's not forged while transmitted uh, from the client to the server. Uh, this is a powerful kind of token. It is uh, uh, the choice of uh, the famous protocol OAuth2, or framework OAuth2. Um, so it's recommended there. And uh, mostly uh, it is used uh, in the form of a reference token, but nothing prevents us to uh, charge it with additional information. And now we reach the most powerful kind of tokens in the format classification. Uh, this is the JWT family pronounced JOT. Uh, I prefer the JWT because of my bad pronunciation of words. Uh, so we got used to JWT. Uh, basically JWT is a kind of template for all the others of uh, tokens token types from the family, uh, whereas the most important and most widely used are the web signature token, JWTS and JWTE. The first one, the signature says that uh, the content um, of the header is, oh, sorry, excuse me, <laughs> the content of the token is signed. So it can be verified uh, by the uh, audience of the token the one who receives it, that uh, the token was not forged uh, during the transmission or uh, by some uh, fraudulent party on the client side. Uh, if we also want to hide the content of the token to make it unreadable, then, then we have the option to encrypt it. We even can encrypt it only partially uh, under some uh, concrete agreement. And in that case, uh, it is important to remember that uh, if uh, the content, the payload is encrypted, we need to uh, at least duplicate some of the identification fields of, of the token in the header, because otherwise we just wouldn't know who actually this token just cannot make the checks alone without some meta information. And the rest of the tokens are more advanced. They can transfer uh, encryption keys or set of keys. And the last one is used uh, for registration of cryptographic algorithms. So uh, parties can automatically decide on uh, suitable available algorithms uh, uh, and use them when exchanging, uh, exchanging tokens. Next slide, please. Now we have another category. This is the function. 
this is more interesting for uh, our discussion, probably. Um, the first one is the ID token, uh, which obviously is uh, enclosing some identification and related information. The access token, we already mentioned, is used uh, for the purpose to allow access or maybe prevent access to client applications to some resources. Uh, in the previous slide, I, I said that OAuth2 is uh, uh, recommending a OPEC token for access token. And that's the case of many applications. Uh, it does not need to be JWT in or out, but on the Zetos, on Zoe and APML in particular, we use a JWT token as access token. Uh, the last token is uh, uh, very powerful. Um, no worries, I, I'll just uh, say a few words. Uh, it allows us to uh, keep a user session longer. Uh, so because all the tokens have their expiration time, when it happens, users get frustrated that uh, if they didn't save their work or were just in the middle of submitting some very important information, uh, then they may not uh, finish their work. Uh, so the refresh token allows two things. First is to prolong existing session. And in some cases, it allows us also to create a new session, but connect it to the stored state of the previous one. So have some kind of detached in time behavior. Next one, please. Now, the first one, the identity token. Um, it's meant to identify the user and to provide this information to the client application. This is specific for the protocols that I mentioned before, uh, OAuth2 and OIDC. OIDC man means uh, Open ID Connect, uh, the most modern protocol in the security world nowadays. Um, and uh, in these two protocols, the user is not authenticated directly in the client application. So uh, the client application actually does not know who the user is. In order to have the user credentials like uh, ID and eventually some other data, it needs to receive it from the party which provided the authentication, the so-called authorization server. Uh, the identity token is a JWT token. Uh, it contains uh, claims, as all the JWT tokens. Uh, these claims uh, uh, can be some standard as a sub, like the subject, or expiration, or time of issue, etc. But it also can contain claims like name, address, uh, email, any other that is suitable for the purpose and available at the authorization server. Uh, claims can be registered, so they are really generic and can be used uh, uh, with confidence, then there are claims that we can define and they can be public, so they can be visible everywhere, or they can be even private claims that can be hidden. A very interesting claim to, no, to mention here is the AT hash claim, which actually is uh, a claim uh, given to the client application to understand, uh, to, be, to be sure that the access token which it's uh, used uh, which, that this token is not forged by the time. Uh, the pictures which I have here uh, just show the way how this token is used. So a client application owning a identity token can redeem it uh, for uh, getting back some, I'm sorry, this is the second picture, uh, which is redeeming the token at the user info and endpoint to receive information about the user or it can send uh, a code, secret code, to the authorization server to obtain the user identity token. Next slide, please. Access token. The most widely used token. Sometimes it is called access token even if it is not actually exactly access token. Uh, very often, people mix ID token, identity token with access token using one for the other. Uh, this is sometimes unfortunate because the information contained, contained in the one is not uh, intended to be used by the other one. So it's kind of disclosing information to not to the right hands. But anyways, it's a token uh, issued to the client 
to be sent to the audience, which is the resource server. So on the picture uh, on the right side, you can see that the client which owns the token, the Z coin or token, uh, wants to access some resource at the API V1 SRV and is sending this request along with the token. Then the resource server definitely needs to validate uh, if the token is still valid and not forged. It can do it actually itself in the case of JWT, but uh, I have here the more general way uh, always available uh, to validate the token at the authorization server which issued that. And finally, if the token is valid, then uh, nothing prevents the resource server to allow access to the resources which are guarded there. Um, what? Yep, that's fine. That's okay. Um, and the refresh token, as I shortly explained, it serves uh, for uh, the purpose to be able to prolong or uh, yeah to restart the user session. It is specific uh, for both OAuth and OIDC protocols. Um, it represents the client credentials in this case, not the user credentials. So if the client receives such token after the authentication or authorization flow, then the client can be represented by this token together with uh, some secret uh, in order to ask the authorization server for additional access tokens. So effectively to prolong the session. Mm. There are a couple of notes about it. This token eliminates the need to perform user authentication every time. So when the session is ended or based, based on the access token, uh, then we can uh, have some lighter version of uh, the user authentication or even none at all. If we decide that the client site is confident having the access token again uh, valid by asking for renewal the authorization server. Uh, also, it can be redeemed at the authorization server, but should be never sent to the resource server. So this token is different by the access token. Never use refresh token to access resources. And uh, it should be stored in the, shouldn't be stored uh, on a client which doesn't have a secure storage. There is a wide variety of applications nowadays, some running on a desktop, some uh, running as a command line interfaces, and some running in a browser or mobile. Uh, not all kinds of applications are capable of storing securely uh, these uh, tokens. So uh, the most uh, uh, recommended technique is uh, to store them only when you have a server site. Actually, some uh, implementations, uh, the implementations of the security flows uh, does not allow to issue such a token to parties, to clients which are not secure, like, for example, desktop applications. Pavlin, quick time check. Yep. Just a yep. few minutes left. Next, please. Okay. Yeah, all right. So these are the uh, tokens, uh, sorry, the best practices. Uh, they're really general. Uh, read them, uh, talk about them, write us a question. We'll be happy to answer and extend it, uh, but uh, for the sake of time, uh, we'll move further, please. Here, I want to talk about the self-identity token, about MFA, client access, and session lifecycle. This is the last part of my presentation. I hope I'll be covering them very shortly and briefly. Uh, please ask questions then, we'll be happy to discuss because this is very interesting material. Uh, sometimes it gets more technical than it's easy to explain in a short presentation. Nevertheless, I'll start with the sentence that you, statement that you see here. I want to say that although here we talk about future improvements, uh, we don't mean less secure. Zoe is as secure as the mainframe is using all the capabilities of the mainframe available uh, in that sense. But uh, there is a way, there are ways how to enhance further the um, security st standard and user experience uh, without trading the current security uh, lay uh, layer level. Next, please. So the self-identity token, what it is, is a JWT. It contains claims about the user uh, it's an identity token, actually. It can be signed or even unsigned, but this has some limitations of usage. 
Uh, and interestingly, it expires when the user password expires. So uh, this is kind of uh, more secure and the kind of complication in the user comfort. Uh, what it can be used actually for? It can be used to link multiple authentication API calls. That means that if several services have to call one, the next one, then, um, then they need to be on the same page with the security. So this token can be used to link the multiple calls to multiple services and still knowing that who was the originator of the initial call. Then it can be used to replay proof of authentication. This is the basic token usage. You exchange username and password, maybe other credentials uh, for a token and then use it regularly instead of the username and password. Uh, it can implement security, complex security flows. Uh, it has the notion of a transaction, which means that uh, the detached calls from client to the server, to the resource server, can be interconnected uh, th thanks to this transaction identification. Uh, for example, user password uh, uh, renewal is such a complex flow when you need to do several calls. The first one is rejected when the password is expired, then you initiate the password change and you then get access back. Uh, it also can be used to bind ac user access to specific application because uh, these tokens are issued uh, as uh, a, a, or identified by the application, the user and the issuer of the token. Uh, the benefits. Michal already mentioned that the biggest benefit is that you have a single token for all your needs. Uh, what it means is that uh, you can have, for example, full-sized Zetos SSO, not only API ML SSO, because even services which are not deployed, visible uh, or discoverable on API ML can redeem the token at SAF and get access to the resources needed so they don't need to be onboarded on API ML. Uh, it also uh, says that the pass tickets are not necessary. I don't say the pass tickets uh, should be discharged at all, but uh, imagine that you need to uh, make some composition of data and you need to call 10 services, then you probably will need to generate 10 pass tickets. It's consuming resources uh, and uh, at time and it's not handy. Um, so, uh, there is also no need to switch the user context when uh, a, a service is, does not work with past tickets. You can use directly the SAF token. Next slide, please. Now we come to the MFA, very interesting topic, but uh, it's quite a large thing. I, I tried to compile the most important part of it. It is that uh, the client application can delegate the collection and evaluation of authentication factors, more than one, presumably to an external system. Uh, so we can work with IBM MFA, which is a, a system that provides user interface where the factors are collected. And the end, it generates a special token, which is called a cache token. And this token is understood by SAF. So when this token is concatenated to a password, client application is actually sending two factors, not only one, to uh, SAF. And this is uh, raising the security a level up. Uh, while this is completely true, that multi-factor is the best way how to uh, raise the confidence that the user is the one who they claim to be, um, it is uh, not uh, very handy in implementing for the clients. And uh, I'll be glad to point out in the next slide uh, at least a couple of uh, limitations. Please, next slide. Uh, so the, one of the problem or not problem but uh, challenges is that MFA is configured per user. And so when the user uh, is uh, configured to use MFA, this is for all the applications, as far as I know. Uh, that means that then all the applications that the user wants to use will ask or have to ask for MFA, otherwise SAF will reject access. Uh, there is uh, also the external authorization server, but it actually, actually acts as an authentication server only. It doesn't check uh, any authorization rights. It will just verify who the user is and will issue a token. Um, 
and there is uh, no direct control on the number of choice of factors applied. It's left to the configuration of the external server. So SAF doesn't manage how many factors would be asked for this application or for another application. Some applications may require even higher level of security, so more than two factors. And finally, from SAF point of view, the multi factors here are only two, because when SAF doesn't know how many factors were used and is receiving a single token, then these are actually two factors. Uh, then the, maybe last or one before the last is uh, the client access limitations. Very important thing that we always are talking about the user access rights, but actually, if we imagine that in the world of enterprise systems there could be many applications which are touching the same resources it is important to be able to limit some applications the applications to use only the resources that they are allowed to and this is done by uh, a system of claims in the tokens which are called scopes um, so uh, we don't have it at the moment so this is a proposed uh, uh, extension to uh, the Zoe or APML uh, capabilities. Uh, in that sense, a token which is issued to a single up to one application uh, cannot be misused by another application if it does not have the appropriate access rights. And um, if we move to the next slide, here is a very short uh, vision on enhancement of the session life cycle. We already touched uh, the point that uh, if you start working with some um, data and in the middle of the work, your session expires and it is not renewed to the state where you were before it expired. So you may lost, lose your work and data. Uh, so uh, managing the life cycle, session life cycle is important uh, for the user comfort and uh, tokens allow this. Uh, by uh, implementing a refresh capability, uh, which is uh, part of the specifications of the modern protocols. Oh, yeah, basically, I wanted to say what are the benefits, but they're very straightforward, so you can read it. So I give back the word to Michal for final takeaways. Thank you. This will be very quick. So I, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, the audience for listening to our content. Uh, we hopefully audience got uh, an understanding of JATS in Zoe. You, you heard about the standard tokens to, and, and their mechanics that are used perhaps outside of the mainframe world, not employed in Zoe yet. And um, you heard about possible enhancements to security. We, will, we uh, will be happy to discuss these a little bit more in, in the community channels. Thank you. Uh, going back to Rose. Thanks, Mikhail. Thanks, Pavlin. Sorry to rush you guys. We've got some glossary slides there as well. And we will head on over. Um, so in addition to guiding new to Zoe people to the appropriate community forum, the onboarding squad assists with welcoming new vendors, Zoe extenders, and Zoe incubator project teams. Uh, we manage the Zoe conformance program. We help to provide speakers for events, large and small. We manage Zoe blog content. We manage Zoe surveys and manage collecting and posting Zoe metrics. This used to be a tedious process until one of our members changed all of that. Ah, the power of automation. Over to you, Andrew. Let's talk about Zoe onboarding and Zoe metrics. Thank you, Rose. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk about the new method of collecting and presenting metrics that we've got within Zoe. Um, as Rose said at the start, if there are any questions throughout, pop them in the chat and I will come back to them at the end. I'm conscious of time, so I will get started. So before the project started, uh, the metrics reporting process was uh, it was a selection of slides put together at the start of every month with download values, community members and lots of things to show the previous month's progress. Um, as you can see on the screen now. Um, while these values are useful to see and show elements of progression, um, it was very time consuming for a member of the team and it doesn't show the data as comprehensively as possible. So we were tasked with automating this as much as possible, whether that be just the collection or the presentation or both. Um, so that was our task. Next, next slide, please. So Initially, we investigated automating the collection of the metrics. The main issue we ran into was 
the data comes from a variety of sources. Um, a few examples are on screen now. There's the VS Code Marketplace for the Zoe Explorer, and the NPM registry, which is one of the places the Zoe CLI comes from, Google Analytics, Slack, GitHub, but the list goes on. Um, when collecting them manually, you can just visit the site and copy the numbers. However, autonomously with code, it's not quite that simple. So some of the sites have APIs behind them, like Google Analytics, for example. You just hit a URL and it gives you the data back with authentication, obviously. Um, on the other side of that, some sites don't have APIs or any clear way at all about getting numbers. So as you can see, the VS Code Marketplace is one of these. The display at the top is the download value um, of that item, that component. But there's no obvious explanation as to where it comes from. So this is where some more complicated techniques came in, like web scraping, as an example. Um, web scraping is it's a method of extracting data from the HTML page by getting the source code and extracting the required information, which is exactly how we got this and a lot of the other values for the metrics. So the code at the bottom is the HTML code making up the Zoe Explorer Marketplace page. Um, so at this point, we had the methods for retrieving the data from the various sources, we just needed to bring it all together and offer it in a simple way, which is where creating our own API came in. So this was a good choice because of its simplicity and it gives the opportunity to expand upon it, which I'll touch on again later. Um, so we wrote an express API with Node.js that offers endpoints to retrieve this data. For anyone interested in the tech behind this process, we're hoping the code will become open source for people to take inspiration from, if not use, and we'll get some documentation published as well to go alongside it. Um, so watch this space. We have been approached by other teams already that want to implement something similar. So it'd be good to get this out there. Um, yeah, so the next obstacle, uh, we wanted to show uh, past metrics as well as live data. So for this, we decided to use a MongoDB database. Uh, it's simple to use, quick to set up, um, it talks nicely to Node.js APIs. So what that does, it stores all the data we've collected in the past with the date so we can track the past data as well as live data. So that's coming really useful. And uh, finally, we wanted an updated method to view the metrics. So in theory, the API could be used to create the report manually. It would act as a middleman and cut out the actual data collection. So now we're talking about the presentation uh, of the metrics rather than the collection. We decided a website um, would be the best solution to present this data in a simple manner to users, whether that's you know squad members, management, current consumers, or future consumers. Um, and it allows the flexibility as well about how the data is presented. Um, so like the API, it was written in Node.js, um, it renders HTML, and it also gives the flexibility of using NPM packages. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel for certain tasks. Um, so yeah, it's made up of three main elements, the web page, the API, and the database. Each of them runs in a Docker container. And I can hopefully start sharing my screen and show it now. Uh, share. There we go. Can you see my screen? I can. Excellent. So this is what the page looks like. So first we get to the dashboard, it's the home screen. It shows the download values for some of the different Zoe components. So we have the CLI, the Explorer, and the server-side downloads. For those that are confused, the server-side downloads are the SMPE builds and the PTFs and the convenience build. Um, so it also shows the community members, contributors, and the number of component products. These are just some key statistics we picked on to have on the home screen. They, they publicize Zoe well. Um, and at the end of this page, we have a monthly community report section, which I will come back to in just a second. Um, but first, going through the pages at the top, first we have a downloads page. Um, so this itself is split up into three sections. We have the Explorer, the CLI, and the server builds. Each tab is set up the same way. It shows a trend line of the total downloads over the past few months. It's a cumulative graph, so it shows downloads over time. And scrolling down, we also have a chart of the downloads per month. One statistic we always show is the Zoe Explorer downloads in September last year. This coincides with the Master the Mainframe course, and it just shows how much that single event boosted the popularity in that month especially and the months following. 
um, which is really nice to see visually on a graph. Um, just quickly, the other tabs are set up in exactly the same way. Apart from the CLI and the server tabs, we're able to see downloads by version number because of the way they're stored. So these are downloaded from zoe.org. And because of that, we can see which version of the component they've downloaded, which is always nice to see, as well as the downloads over time and per month. So moving on to the community tab. So here we can see Slack and GitHub data. Um, channels, participants, messages, replies from Slack, also on graphs to see. And it's the same with GitHub, PRs, issues, repos, and submitters. It's good to see that change over time as well. And finally, the analytics section. So this page shows information about Zoe.org site itself. So we can see just page views, total users, and out of those users, how many of them were considered new. So visiting the site for the first time. Uh, and it also shows users by geography, which is really cool. So we can see whereabouts in the world they're visiting from on a table and on a chart. Cool. So uh, I did mention earlier, I was going to come back to the dashboard. Uh, I hope I'm not going too long. Um, so we decided to continue producing the monthly reports as well as having this web page, but autonomously. So a program is run on the first of every month using cron jobs to produce a PDF report, um, which appears in this list here. It's been running since January, so there are currently three reports to show, but on the 1st of May, there will be the fourth. Uh, so if we pick February, for example, and show report, they show the exact same information as the web page, but it captures a specific moment in time, um, as you can see. So it, we'll just pick the first page, for example, Zoe Explorer. It shows the cumulative downloads to date. So this would have been at the end of February. It shows the cumulative downloads over time in a table and a graph and the downloads per month. And exactly the same with the CLI. It does replicate the web page, shows the same data, but it's nice to have it in a different format uh, to use. And if we scroll right to the bottom, you can also see the GitHub metrics and Slack metrics there as well. Now, the final piece of the puzzle is another use for the metrics API It's not just this web page. So as you will hear more about after me, I hope, Zoe.org has had a big revamp recently, and this is the new site. One of the changes uh, we've made was an addition of a Zoe by the numbers section. Oh, also nice to point out that the webinar we're on right now appears in the events section on Zoe.org, which is nice. But if we scroll down, we have a Zoe by the numbers section. This hits our new metrics API and retrieves certain numbers, uh, the same numbers on the dashboard of the website and displays them here. Uh, it just shows the flexibility that the metrics API offers. I hope we can keep adding to it and using it in cool ways like this into the future. But yeah, I think that is everything I have to show. Thank you, everyone. If there are any questions, as I said, pop them in the chat and I will come back to them in a second. I think that's Fantastic. everything, Rose. Thank you going to go back. And advance beyond our backup slides. That way they're just in case the demo gods hit, which they didn't seem to. We are blessed. Okay, final few slides. Um, so this by no means is a comprehensive list of what's been introduced over the past three months but we wanted to make you aware of a few of the highlights here. As um, Andrew mentioned, um, the zoe.org website has been restructured based on a tremendous amount of feedback. Um, next, uh, thanks to many of you for taking our semi-annual survey. If you're interested in reviewing the results, you'll find a link at zoe.org in the announcements section that Andrew showed right at the top. There's a link there. Um, the Zoe Technical Steering Committee was formed and meets every week. You'll learn more about the squad, its purpose and intent at our PI planning opening coming up soon. And um, there is a notice, uh, particularly to all Zoe extenders, um, those of you who are conforming, have conformant CLI plugins, app framework extensions, or APIs, and soon Zoe Explorer extensions, please be on the lookout for the new V2 LTS conformance criteria for each of these components. We'll be posting details over the next quarter. 
And then finally, the CLI squad has introduced several new features that are available for validation only, meaning not planned for this V1 LTS release at this point. And we are looking for feedback. Um, if you're interested, um, the uh, link to the website where you can get the information, the features is listed here, github.com backslash Zoe backslash Zoe dash uh, CLI pound sign early dash access dash, dash features rolls right off the tongue. <laughs> um, we're going to run a three question poll on this in just one moment. One minute, Andrew, I'll give you the okay to run that poll. Um, as we mentioned, the redesigned Zoe website, thank you, thank you to the collaboration of both Zoe Onboarding and Zoe Doc Squads. We introduced uh, this site on April 13th. It has content rich pages. Um, if you're visiting, don't be shy about paging down. As Andrew showed, there's lots of information right on that landing page. We have updated content videos new navigation options based on your intent, whether you're learning, using, extending, contributing, et cetera. Uh, and Andrew just demoed in real time the access to those metrics. So please go ahead and check that out. And um, for our poll, Andrew, if you could go ahead and launch that, I will read through their three simple questions. The first one, what best describes your use of Zoe? Um, do you contribute and use? Do you extend and use? Meaning you write CLI plugins or other extensions such as App Framework or APIs for the mediation layer. Um, do you use Zoe? Meaning you're actually implementing it at your company and you're experimenting with it. Uh, perhaps you plan to use it or you don't use it all. So that's question one. Question two. With respect to the early access features that I just mentioned, the CLI squad has introduced. These are available for validation only. Um, the first one is using global profile configuration. This is a simple, simplified profile management feature. Uh, the second is using daemon mode with Zoe X. This is a performance improvement for the Zoe CLI. And then third, um, we have built in the secure credential store, which is currently a plugin. What we wanna know on this question is, what is your plan for these client-based features? Will you A, wait for GA, meaning wait until they go live with the V2 LTS release before you even look at them or investigate them? Will you B, start investigating them now Will you see, learn about them and consider installing them or install them right away? Or D, not sure. And then third question, what um, for if you are a Zoe user, please indicate what best describes your use of Zoe CLI and the Zoe Explorer. So if you could complete that, I will wrap us up really quickly here. Let's see. Okay, just wanna make you aware of our upcoming quarterly PI planning meetings. If you're interested in learning what was delivered over the past quarter, you're interested in learning about the new TSE, uh, want to listen and understand what's planned for the upcoming quarter, we recommend you attend these two sessions. There are many more meetings going on throughout the PI planning event, which is scheduled to start next Wednesday, but we recommend that you absolutely consider um, these two sessions. I will see if I can copy a link into the chat before we close. Um, and then see if you're interested in attending any of the upcoming release demos so we put out releases and then we offer a demo of what's in that release we have dates planned for those as well for uh, 1.21 22 and 23 again look in the zoe calendar link for these sessions 
interested in that. Um, for upcoming educational sessions, look for Zoe Squad Lead Mike Bauer and Zoe Contributor and Architect Dan Kalowski at CDCon on June 23rd. You'll learn about Zoe in the context of mainframe development. Uh, and if you missed share last month, please go back and check out the Zoe sessions available for replay. It should be very easy to find the Zoe sessions there. Um, there's always re fresh and relevant content, Zoe blogs at medium.com um, at the Zoe area or the modern mainframe area at medium.com. Ashley's um, blog on the new revamp website is there. Please go ahead and check that out. Um, and finally, you're always welcome to join any and all of our meetings. Uh, most we weekly meetings um, are uh, open, available, and just about anyone can join our uh, Slack channels at the open mainframe pro project.slack.com. And with that, um, thank you for attending today. We will be back here in July, on July 21st, same time. Uh, please go ahead and mark your calendars. And um, we'll get that link set up and sent out and posted on the Zoe calendar as soon as possible. So we hope that you found this information informative. Thanks so much for joining us. Have a great quarter and be well.